Early in the year, when we start talking about chemical reactions and stoichiometry, one of the things that we look at is empirical formula and uh, synthesis of compounds. The single most common lab that I've ever done making compounds or a synthesis of a compound and then empirical formula has involved using a crucible, some magnesium, and heating it for a long period of time and making magnesium oxide and then having our students calculate the formula of magnesium oxide, which is MgO. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. For a very long time, I was annoyed by that particular experiment because my students, at least some of my students, had remembered from earlier in the year that magnesium is in the alkali earth family, and it can have only one oxidation state, plus two. They know the oxidation state for oxygen is minus two, and it's pretty easy to dry lab the experiment, and that kind of bothered me. So I've spent a lot of time looking for a lab that used a different element, preferably a transition metal, which had a bunch of oxidation states, and so it wasn't obvious what the product was going to be. Um, the best one I've seen so far is the synthesis, the synthesis of manganese 2 chloride. Now, obviously, I wouldn't call it that because that just defeated the entire concept, but instead, it would be the synthesis of a manganese compound. And like so many things, we've spent some time working on it and trying to small scale it. Once again, there will be a PDF with this with all of the specific instructions for the lab, but I wanted to show you very quickly just some of the aspects of it to give you a sense of how neat and clean this particular lab is and some of the real advantages to it. One of the big, big advantages to this lab is it can be done in one period and done in one period by the vast majority of students. And that includes heating a precipitate to dryness, which is pretty hard to do generally in a, in a laboratory situation. So take a look at the lab. This is a small scale lab. We're using small quantities. I have inside this weighing boat some manganese metal that I have ground up by hitting it with a hammer a few times. or a physical change facilitator for those of you that are a little bit, uh, you know, if you've been to a graduate course or two. And so I've gathered a small quantity in here. I would weigh this ahead of time. I'm not going to, or I would weigh this in the lab. I'm not going to do that at this point. I'm simply going to transfer it into this 10 milliliter flask, or 10 milliliter flask that I have over here and drop it in. So I'm going to dump that in like so. Students would have massed that material ahead of time, so now we would know the mass of manganese that we've placed inside the, the flask. And that would be one of the pieces of information we would use eventually to calculate the empirical formula. Um, now we need to dissolve the manganese, and to do that, we're going to add to it a few drops of concentrated hydrochloric acid. Uh, it works with anything uh, 9 molar or above. Uh, this just turns out to be con. And I'm going to drop a few in, and I think, hopefully, you can see that there's some bubbling taking place. 10, 12 drops will dissolve the amount that the instructions in the experiment tell you to use. Maybe a little more than that. This time I've just dumped in some extra, but very quickly that dissolves. I would do this probably in a fume hood in my classroom, at least this part of the lab. and. That'll just cut down on the, the small amount of hydrogen chloride that off-gasses from the concentrated or the high concentration HCl I'm working with. So I'll set this out of the way. Instructions then tell the students to wait until the reaction is complete, and they can tell it's complete because they won't see any bubbling occurring any longer. And this is getting pretty close. There's still a few small pieces left that are bubbling, so we'll let it sit for just a second. Uh, this whole process, massing the stuff out, getting it into the flask, adding the hydrochloric acid, is going to take maybe 15 minutes. Um, kids moving slowly, it's going to take maybe 15 minutes. Once they have that collected and the precipitate or, and the uh, solid has 
completely reacted. Now they need to, to evaporate it. The first time I did it, I tell them to evaporate it over a Bunsen burner inside a fume hood, because now you're going to drive off the HCL for sure. So that part really needs to be done inside a fume hood or a, a well-ventilated area. Um, what I discovered was that if you do it over top of a Bunsen burner, you heat it too fast. The compound that's produced in this thing is heat sensitive, and it breaks down. And so instead of getting the desired product, you end up with some black junk stuck in the bottom of the flask. So you need a way to evaporate the liquid a little slower. The way that we always did that in my chemistry classes in college was to go to a sand bath. Now, you can buy commercial sand baths, but they're relatively expensive. Or you can make your own sand bath. Hot plate with a container, either a Pyrex beaker, or you can use a tuna fish can, or whatever works for you, and set some sand inside that. Set it on the hot plate. You can crank the hot plate up to the highest setting, and then set your container down inside there and let it heat. You've got a sand bath. In, remember how much I put in here was only 10 or 15 drops at the most. It's not going to take very long for that liquid to be driven off. Again, this, is, this should be done in a well-ventilated area. You are going to off-gas any excess HCl that you did not have in the reaction. So a fume hood would be great. If you don't have a fume hood, again, just someplace in your room where it's well ventilated or spread it out around the windows or something like that, but you need a way to, to deal with the, the vapors that are there and you don't want your students hanging over top of it. Uh, if you use an Erlenmeyer flask like we used here, a 10 milliliter one, you can put it into the sand bath directly. I didn't have a lot of these 10 milliliter Erlenmeyers, I used test tubes. A 13 by 100 or a small test tube works just as well. Your sand bath needs to be a little deeper. So you just have a deeper container for it, and then you can slide that thing down in the sand bath and heat it. It takes maybe 10, 15 minutes maximum to drive off all of that solid. When you get done, and here we go to the, to the Julia Child moment. And when you are finished, your product will come out looking like this. And if you pull it back out, you'll get something that looks a little bit like this. Now, what you're seeing here, and I want you to, want to point out a couple of things. This is a pinkish colored solid. Manganese 2 chloride that's anhydrous without water in it is a very, very light pink solid. Manganese to chloride dihydrate is a fairly bright pink solid. This product that I produced right here is a little bit in between. Most of your students will get something a little bit in between. But if they calculate the formula for the compound using the information they have, the mass of the manganese that they started with, and ex an excess of hydrochloric acid so that now they can do a subtraction from the product to find out the chloride or the chlorine that's in there, they'll get an empirical formula that comes out to be real close to MnCl2, which is what it's supposed to be. What's great about this is if you go to the periodic table and you look at the oxidation states for manganese, there's a whole bunch of them. And so if they get something else, they may find justification for it by looking at the oxidation states that are listed on the periodic table. So I, I found this to be a really nice one. This is the one that I used for quite a while as an empirical formula one. Generally the kids get crystals that are actually a little pinker than these. Um, the, water does, the water does affect it, but it's not an enormous problem. I, I've had better results with this than probably any empirical formula lab that I've done. It's kind of neat. It does use something with more than one oxidation state. Uh, uses small quantities of materials. The one drawback that I see to it, you do need some ventilation for this one. The product, when you're finished with it, manganese is a relatively heavy metal. You need to dispose of that appropriately.